Thank you. Thank you so much. According to the Oxford University Press's World Christian Encyclopedia, 84% of the world's population belongs to some form of organized religion and believes in some form of God, which at the end of this year is about 5.9 billion people. Christians have about 2 billion of those 5.9 billion. About half of those are Catholics. Muslims come in at just a tad over 1 billion. Hindus at around 850 million. Buddhists at almost 400 million. And then a several hundred million other ethno-religionists, animists, and other God believers around the world. Worldwide, there are about 10,000 distinct religions, each one of which may be further subdivided and classified. Christians, for example, may be apportioned among about 34,000 different denominations. From a scientist's perspective, such percentages uh, believe cry out for an explanation. Why do so many people believe these things? But from a skeptic's perspective, which is what I do, what are the chances that these guys got the right God and the right religion and the billions of other people that don't believe what they believe got it wrong? When you leave the house tonight, just ask yourself that question. What are the chances that they just happened to get it right and the tens of billions of people that lived before Jesus they never heard of it. The tens of billions of people that have lived since then who don't believe that, they just happen to be wrong? Or is it more likely that all of these religion and God beliefs are socially constructed, psychologically constructed, and that none of them are right in any reality sense, in any ontological sense? They're all constructed this way. In my uh, few minutes, I will present to you two lines of uh, of evidence for this claim that humans created God and religion, not vice versa. The first is evolutionary theory, the second is uh, social psychology, comparative world religions and mythology. First, we go back in time, our story goes back millions of years. So put yourself back in time, let's say three and a half million years ago. You're a little hominid on the plains of Africa a little Australopithecine. Your name is Lucy. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of people in America don't get that joke. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Well, if you assume that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type 1 error, a false positive. You thought A was connected to B, but you're wrong. That's a relatively harmless error to make. You just become more cautious, vigilant, skittish, like you see animals on the plains of Africa today. On the other hand, if you think the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, your lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. And we are the descendants of those who are most likely to make type 1 errors versus type 2 errors, false positives rather than false negatives. Now, why can't you just sit there in the grass and collect more data until you get it right? Because predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they're stealthy and stalk their prey. So we evolved the propensity to make snap decisions. The rule of thumb is assume all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators and not the wind, just in case. Assume everything you read and hear and see is real. Now, what's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator. The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. His intention is to eat me, and that probably can't be good. So we also evolved the capacity not only to find these patterns and make those one's kinds of errors instead of the other, assume everything is real, we also infuse into those patterns intentional agency. We just think everything is not just real, but real and animated, alive, even if it's invisible. We now have a lot of evidence from cognitive psychology that this begins at a very early age, perhaps as early as age two or three. I, I'll just give you one experiment among many. Uh, Jesse Baring's research with little children uh, who are brought into a room and they're given one of these little balls with Velcro on it and you throw it at the dartboard and it sticks on it. That's the goal. 
So they're brought into the room, but they're not allowed to just do that with their good hand. They're turned, they're turned around and they have to do it backwards. So they're really bad at it, as any of us would be. And, and then uh, the experimenter leaves the room and, and he says, just do the best you can and come out and tell me how you did. So of course they all walk up there and just stick it on the thing, right? <laughs> all right, part two of the experiment. Uh, the little children are brought in and each of them is told, right next to the dart dartboard is a chair here. On the chair is Princess Anne. She's an invisible princess and she can see everything you're doing. Experimenter leaves the room, all of a sudden the children stop going up to cheat. The shadow of enforcement, the, the sort of infusion of agency in, uh, of an invisible being in a chair that sees what we do, keeps track of our moral behavior, begins at a very early age. Our brains have evolved this capacity for agency. That's the earliest God beliefs. Okay, next line of evidence. Here's what happened about five to seven thousand years ago. These animistic, simple God beliefs and sort of social religions that evolved to help us uh, live together as a social primate species began to break down as populations grew from a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals to thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people in state societies, from bands and tribes to chieftains and states. We needed some more formal means of behavior control and enforcing the rules of social cooperation. Two institutions evolved for that, government and religion. Government says, here's a copy of the rules, everybody gets one, and here's the punishments if you break the rules. Religion says, if you think you got away with it and you cheated the state, nah, -uh. there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all, and in the next life, justice will be served. That's a very powerful force for social control. Again, if it happens with little kids, you can do it with adults, uh, which is what churches are all about. So that's the modern version. That's what happens with that. Now, second line of inquiry on social phenomenon and comparative world religions. As a back-of-the-envelope calculation within an order of magnitude ac accuracy, we can safely uh, conclude that over the last 10,000 years of history, there's been about 10,000 different religions and roughly about 1,000 different gods. Again, the house question for you, which root side of the room you leave on tonight. What is the probability that Yahweh is the one true God in Amun-Ra, Aphrodite, Apollo, Baal, Brahman, Ganesha, Isis, Mithras, Osiris, Shiva, Thor, Vishnu, Wanton, Zeus, and the other 986 gods are all false gods. You guys are atheists just like me of all the gods I just rattled off. Some of us just go one god further. Now, think about this as another thought experiment. If you happen to be born in, say, the United States or England in the, last, in the 20th century, there's a good chance that you believe that Yahweh is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe who manifested into flesh through Jesus of Nazareth. If you happen to have been born in India in the 20th century, there's a very good chance you're a Hindu who believes that Brahma is the unchanging, infinite, transcendent creator of all matter, energy, time, and space, and who manifests into flesh through Ganesha, the blue elephant god who is the most worshipped divinity in India. To an anthropologist from Mars, these are all indistinguishable. Of course, they're individually different, but taking the big picture, they're all indistinguishable in that sense. Even within the three great Abrahamic religions, who can say which is the right one? Christians believe that Jesus is the Savior, and you must accept him to uh, receive eternal life in heaven. Jews do not accept Jesus as their Savior. Neither do Muslims. In fact, roughly 2 billion of the world's 5.9 billion don't. Uh, except that. So what happens to them? Again, are they really right and all those other good people who believe just as passionately as they do are wrong? Where Christians believe that the Bible is an inherent gospel handed down from the deity, Muslims believe that the Quran is the perfect word of God. It's unfortunate that the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book. Christians believe that Christ is the latest prophet. Muslims believe that Muhammad is the latest prophet. Mormons believe that Joseph Smith is the latest prophet. And stretching this track of thought just a little bit more, 
Scientologists believe that the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard was the latest prophet. So many prophets, so little time. <laughs> Flood myths, very common throughout history. Predating the biblical Noachian flood story by centuries, the Epic of Gilgamesh was written around 1800 BC, warned by Babylonian earth god Ea that other gods were about to destroy all life on a flood, by a flood. Upnapushtim was instructed to build an ark in the form of a cube, a cube. 120 cubits on each side, 180 feet, roughly speaking, uh, with seven floors, each divided into nine compartments in which two of every animal is to be brought onto the, onto the ship. Virgin birth myths likewise spring up throughout time and geography. Among those alleged to have been conceived without the usual assistance of the male lineage, and by the way, Mr. Hitchens, this comes from your brother's book, Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Attis, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and of course, Jesus. Consider the parallels between Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, and Jesus of Nazareth. Both were said to have been born from a virgin mother who was a mortal woman but were fathered by the king of heaven. Both allegedly returned from the dead, transformed water into wine, introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the creator, and to have been the liberator of mankind. Flood myths, not original to you. Virgin birth myths, not original to you. Resurrection myths, not original to you. Osiris is the Egyptian god of life, death, and fertility, and is one of the oldest gods for whom records have survived. Osiris first appears in the pyramid texts around 2400 BC. 2400 before that other guy. By which time his following was already well established. Widely worshipped until the compulsory repression of pagan religions in the early Christian era, Osiris was not only the redeemer and merciful judge of the dead and the afterlife, he was also linked to fertility, most notably and appropriately for the geography, the flooding of the Nile. By the way, there is a, a geographical link between flood myths and bodies of water that flood. Not universal floods, just where you happen to live. The kings of Egypt themselves were inextricably connected with Osiris in death, such that when Osiris rose from the dead, so would they in union with him. By the time of the new kingdom, not only the pharaohs, but the mortal men and women who built the pyramid. So here's what happened. The pharaohs figured out that if you offer eternal life for the workers, they'll work harder and you don't have to pay them as much. So Marx got that right, one of the few things he got right. The opiate of the masses. The masses don't need promises of an afterlife. They need sustenance now. This is a problem with religion. So that's where that comes from. First, you just want, as a pharaoh, a king, a leader, you just want eternal life for yourself. Forget the people. Well, then you find out they'll work harder, and they'll support you more if you give them some alms like, like eternal life. Shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus, there rose another Messiah, Apollonius of Asia Minor whose followers claimed he was the son of God, that he was able to walk through closed doors, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead girl back to life. He was accused of witchcraft, sent to Rome, before the court was jailed, but escaped. After he died, his followers claimed he appeared to them and ascended into heaven. This um, redemption after being oppressed is a very common myth throughout history. And you can understand the psychology behind it. The Native Americans in 1890 began a Messiah myth with a Paiute Indian, Wavoka, who received visions of God. He was thought to be the Messiah or the deliverer of the Messiah, in which the buffalo would all return, the white man would leave and go back to Europe, and life would become better again. This is what oppressed peoples do. They make up stories that makes them feel better. It's often claimed that you can't prove a negative. Let's say theists, we can't prove there is no God. Okay, I can prove that humans created gods and religions, and I just did. And there's, there's 50 more stories like this of, of uh, the geographical location, the time you happen to have been born, the anthropology of religion, the psychology of religion, the sociology of religion. We, we know exactly how this happens now, all the way down to the neurology, the neuroscience of religion. We know that people are making this up. Now, of course, you can make the argument, well, God planted the God module in the brain so he could talk to us or something. 
how come we all seem to talk to different gods then? Are there just a bunch of them out there and they're competing for our brains? Why is it, uh, as, as Dan Barker pointed out, there's very little agreement amongst believers. Why is that? So my conclusion then is that, as you think about the House vote tonight, again, what's more likely? It's obvious that all these other gods are made up. You already know that. You agree with me on that. You're all atheists for all those other gods. So I would just implore you to go one god further. Thank you. All right. <laughs>